this morning, uh, thanks for coming back, by the way. Um, this morning, we, 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 we uh, started with the idea that a farm is not a continuity business until it provides two salaries. So the first thing is to employ yourself, and then you're looking at creating additional salaries. And those, salar those salaries, <clears throat> I've been talking a lot today, are going to be stacked on the existing place. They're not necessarily going to be dependent on gobbling up somebody else. A lot of people say, well, how much land do you need to make a living farming? Well, you know, every time you hear about one that you think is the end of the line, then you hear about one that's even smaller, you know, like the, the quarter acre farm in Rhode Island that supports four full-time salaries on a quarter acre. It's a rose farm. They, 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 they grow and sell roses, okay? And then, you know, then the next thing you hear is some aquaponics deal, you know, that does a full-time living on a shipping container size footprint, okay? So, you know, I don't know how small this, this can go, but, but I do know that it's primarily um, creatively de creative dependent, not so much uh, land volume dependent. So once we've, once we've employed ourselves, how do we get to where we fully employ ourselves? We talked about stacking, value adding, marketing, and uh, one of the things that I'll just, I'll just mention here is that we, we have to take, A, a business approach, and B, we have to come at it from a, an, um, an assumption of abundance and not scarcity. You know, if you're sitting there thinking, well, our farm can never, it can't even support me, let alone somebody else, you know what? You'll be really successful at accomplishing your belief, okay? It's when we come to this saying, we haven't even scratched the surface yet here, that you start seeing opportunities and things open up. So, as we develop in the farm, we need to do gross margin analysis, um, time and motion studies. Do you, know, do you know how long it takes to put on a, a remay row cover? How long does it take to dig a foot of, or 10 feet of potatoes or two pounds of potatoes? You know, how long does it take to put away eggs? And on our farm, we've done time motion studies. All, industry does this all the time. Why do farmers think that we're exempt from this? We're supposed to just get paid because we are special. Yeah. I mean, farmer, farmers are the worst at assuming that because I grow food, I'm special. You know, so I need subsidies and crop insurance and everybody needs to love me and everybody needs to pay way more for their food and all this stuff. You know, we got to get out of the victimhood idea, all right? and just quit being a victim and realize we have to be the change we want to see. So we're not immune to business principles, which are things like time motion studies. You know, um, if you can't tell me um, how many cow days your grass is today, you're not taking care of business. It's one of our big things with our, you know, interns and apprentices. You know, if they're in charge of moving a group of cows, and I go and say, how many... How, much, how many square yards did you give that herd today and they don't know, well, then I start getting pretty irritated. Uh, because how do you make an adjustment if you don't know what you did yesterday? If you go out there and you, and you say, oh, I gave them about 10% too much, if you don't know how much you gave yesterday, how do you give them 10% more to, or 10% less today? Are you with me? So, so we, we, have to, we have to monitor these things. We have to do time and motion studies. We have to know where we are. Okay, so let's assume now that through value adding, stacking, complementary enterprises, multi-speciation, complex synergistic relational uh, um, uh, enterprises, and all these things, we've now employed ourselves. Okay, so how do we, when, when we look at a team, at at looking at our weaknesses, how do we bring on people onto our team that can you know, that, that can do this. Now, the typical way, the typical first place of this is our children. So can I talk to you just a little bit about children? 
Because I don't know how many people come to me and say, how do I get my kids to like weeding carrots? How do I get my kids to like you know, gathering eggs? All right. Number one, more is caught than taught. Our children will generally become excited about the things we're excited about if we're excited about them. The average farmer is not excited about his farm. All he does is mope around all day, can't get no help. Prices are terrible. It's a conspiracy. I mean, how attractive is that to kids? So if we're excited about it, we've got to transfer the passion. You transfer the passion with excitement and a smile. Not being a complainer and a whiner. Okay? The thing is, if, if things are happening that we don't like, it doesn't do any good to whine about them. What's your action plan? Don't tell me what's wrong. Tell me how you fixed it. And we instill that can-do spirit in our children. All right? So, from day one, we instilled, made work competitive and fun. How do you do that? All right, well, you take survey ribbon, and you're going to weed, weed uh, four rows of green beans, right? So you tie a ribbon down here, and you tell your four-year-old, we're going to weed these beans. I'm going to do these two rows. If you can weed your row by the time and get to that ribbon before I do these two, you win. You ready? Start. And you start this competition now, and you turn it into a, you turn it into a, to a, a game. Kids love games. Adults love games, okay? So you turn into a game of competition. Never give time-oriented tasks. Only give task-oriented tasks. Tasks. What's he talking about? Never say go out and spend half an hour weeding the beans. That teaches your kids to dawdle. If there's no incentive for being efficient, if I pick one weed or ten weeds, i got to put them in 30 minutes, so who cares? You know, you want your kids to have piano lessons? Don't tell them to go up and practice for 30 minutes. Tell them, get this song down and you can quit. If you did it in 10 minutes, that's great. If it takes you an hour, that's great. Task-oriented. Time-oriented everything is, uh, teaches dawdling. All right? So make it all task-oriented. Performance-oriented. We never gave... Uh, um, allowances. I'm not a believer in allowances. Nobody should get an, you know, money for breathing. Okay. What you should do is incentivize work and things. Now, there are things that shouldn't be paid for, like you know, cleaning up your room, putting your dirty clothes in the hamper. That's the, you know, uh, that's the stuff you do because you're a member of the human family. And I think we need to make a very clear designation. Here are things that you do because you're a member of a human family. Here are things that are discretionary and you get paid for, and it's okay to ask to get paid for them. And so um, task-oriented things, always task-oriented. And, and don't reward if, you know, if your four-year-old beats you in the green beans. Don't reward her by saying, oh, well, since you were so good, we'll do another row. <laughs> the reward for efficient work being done is not more work. The reward is, you know, an age appropriate, whether it's, you know, reading a story, go, you know, fishing at the brook, skinny dipping, whatever, okay? Um, but, but age appropriate rewards, all right? But task oriented, that teaches efficiency. Um, when Daniel was in diapers, we'd go out and dig post holes. I have, a, I have a PhD degree, you might not know that. Post hole digger degree, okay? And we'd go out and dig post holes. Of course, he'd bring his little Tonka trucks and stuff, you know, out. And he'd play around in the, in the dirt. And, um, and he, he would, you know, he's like a little, you know, child. He'd whine, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty, you know, I'm thirsty. No, we can't drink until we finish two more holes. That's the way I incentivize myself to, you know, to keep pushing, and I'm thirsty too, I want to, you know, but I'm going to do two more holes, then we're going to stop for, for a drink of water. Well, he was about nine, and a neighbor boy, um, you know, as neighbor boys are wont to do, got together, and they had to build a fort, right? Boys build forts, right? And so, um, so we, 
he can go over to the neighbor's house and they can build this fort with this neighbor boy who's eight. He's one year younger than Daniel. About an hour and a half later, the neighbor mom calls us and says, what is it with your son? He won't let my son get a drink of water until they finish that wall of the fort. <laughs> See, more is caught than taught. See? And so we have, we have to think strategically about what we're rewarding. Praise, praise, praise. How many 50-year-olds are still encumbered from trying something new because what they did as youngsters was never good enough? This is a dad thing more than a mom thing. I mean, what difference does it make if the five-year-old goes out and bends over a hundred nails today trying to pound them into a board? You know how much money I spent on those nails, kid? That's how they learn to pound them straight when they're 16. If you want a partner when you're 16, then quit complaining when they're five. Praise, praise, praise. You know, first time a child washes dishes, they probably miss a couple pieces. Easy thing to, to come in and instead of saying, thank you for washing those dishes, what's the first thing we say? Well, you missed a piece there. You missed it there. Praise, praise, praise. Okay? Be thankful for what they're trying to do because you're trying to inculcate a loyal partner. You know, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he says you start with the end in view. I mean, who wants to be around a whiner and complainer all the time? Okay? We want to be around cheerleaders. See? Now, I'm not saying you, you dismiss negligence and lackadaisical work, but you, you know, you're you're your age appropriate, okay, as you come up. And then the next one is to let the children develop their own enterprises. I know this was instrumental for me. When I was 10, I got my first chickens. Dad and mom, our family, we didn't have chickens. So when I got my first chickens, you know, I was the chicken man. You know, I was the chicken guru. Okay, and I had this chicken business throughout my teenage years, and I grew up cutting my teeth, grow, you know, selling at the curb market. I was up, you know, uh, every single Saturday morning. It was an indoor market every single Saturday morning of the year from you know age of about fourteen to eighteen. Um, every single Saturday of the year, I was up at four o'clock to be down at curb market and sell our stuff. Um, so I, I cut my teeth, and I wouldn't take it back for for anything. But I had my own enterprises. Again, no allowance, but I had my own, and I always had a pocket full of money because I had my own business. That's how you teach the importance of profit, for example. Keeping records. Um, I, remember, I remember Daniel, um, he, had his, he had his three little banks on his dresser. He started his rabbits when he was eight, and he had his um, to spend, to save, and uh, tithe, offering. I remember well one time going to town and he pipes up in the back seat. He's about 10 years old. He says, man, I've got to butcher some more rabbits. I don't have any money to give away anymore. What a great reason to have a business is to be able to give money away. See? Because his, his, his tithe jar was empty. See? So um, having that own business is critical. So often we, we don't we, we want to we be helicopter parents. And we're so scared, helicopter, we're hovering over them all the time, you know. Hover, hover, hover. And because we don't want our kids to hurt themselves. But how do you exercise decision-making muscles unless you make decisions? And the freedom to fail is the most exercise you can get on your decision-making muscles. It makes a big difference in a child whether visitors come and and, uh, and the child says, you know, those uh, 50 cows out there, well, two of them are mine. Makes a big difference if a person comes 
And the child can say, here's my enterprise, and I'm the, I'm the guru. So when Daniel started his rabbits, we were real careful, visitors to the farm. Somebody had a question about rabbits. I don't know anything about rabbits. There's the guru. Go ask him. So Daniel was able to take him out there, show him his rabbits, talk about that, because he was the expert. See, what does this do to the self-actualization of a child? Rachel, our daughter, started a baking business when she was, you know, six years old, and, and she'd have all these garden cub ladies come and, you know, pinch her on the cheeks and say, oh, are you the little girl that made the pound cake I fed to my garden club ladies last week? And it was so wonderful. What does that do to the self-empowerment of somebody to be encouraged like that in their own business? See? And so we are real big on allowing those children to spread their wings and do their businesses. So, so task-oriented tax, tasks, incentivization, and uh, praise, 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 and their own businesses. Okay. So, so we, we, you know, we move past the children and we take that same concept to everything else. So what we don't want is we don't want employees. We don't want wages. There's nobody on our place. We have about 20 uh, people that work with us now on the farm, on our team, and nobody gets wages. I hate wages. You know, wages are always a setup for tension between, you know, between the, the, the worker who says uh, he's, you know, working way too much and the employer who says you're spending too much time at the water cooler. So there's always this tension about wages. So I like salaries, commissions, um, you know, subcontractor arrangements, so that performance gets paid for and not just showing up. Performance oriented. Well, you know, we grew up, and I'm happy to say that both of our kids, when they were 20 years old, had $20,000 in the bank from their own earned money. Okay? It wasn't allowance. It was their own stuff. Rachel started a house cleaning business and did her baking and all this stuff. Daniel had his rabbits and he did construction and other things. We homeschooled, which freed our kids up to explore some other things. And um, that, was, that was very powerful. Well, then Daniel and Sherry got married. Now, this really throws a monkey wrench into the family business when you bring in a daughter-in-law. We just, all three of us, Daniel and Sherry and I, just got back from a, from a two-week uh, Oceania tour through uh, New Zealand and Australia doing fields of farmers. So I'm, I'm going to steal some of their material here this afternoon as, as I do this. And um, so, so Sherry talks about finding your place and finding your fit. See... The problem is, in family business dynamics, when a new person comes in, there's a whole lot of pre-understanding of things, a lot of water over the dam that, that you don't, you're not privy to. And it takes some time to realize all of the level of, of, of pre-understandings and things and the different jobs that people do. And so one of the things that Sherry found was that she had to look at polyface and say, okay, you know, mom's taking care of that, and dad's taking care of that, and Daniel's taking care of that, and Aunt Donna's taking care of that, and you know, niece Heidi's taking care of that. And what can I do? And and she will tell you if she were here today, you know, she went through this little period of time of feeling sorry for herself. Where do I fit in? And then she realized one day, I can never be any of them and I can't do their jobs. What do we need that I can do? At the time, we were selling to these metropolitan buying clubs. Now, this is basically a, a fancy way of saying an urban scheduled drop point. We don't do any farmer's markets. Um, and before you go off and say, I hate farmer's markets, let me just say, I think that they are a very inefficient way for product to change hands. Um, my rule of thumb is if you're not making $2,000 per farmer's market trip, you do a lot better doing something else. Okay? Um, farmer's markets have a lot of rules and regs. Uh, 
they, they're speculative. Uh, you can only sell what you take. And so people are limited. Uh, and you have to pack it all up when you get home. What do you do with damaged stuff? People handling it and going through it. And, uh, and they're, they're, it's, it's like a soap opera sometimes. I don't think he grew that. <laughs> are you sure she grew that? You know, it's all this little you know, stuff going on behind the scenes. And, of course, you know, it's really a glorified social gathering. Um, uh, you know, if people actually bought all their food at a farmer's market, it would be sold out in 20 minutes. But, you know, most people can only buy what they can carry in one hand because the other hand is holding on to, you know, uh, a properly pampered and quaffed Fifi the dog, you know. And, um, and, 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 and they, they don't buy bushels of butternut squash. They buy a special little baby food jar with a pretty little orange ribbon on it of, you know, butternut squash puree, you know, for bisque. And uh, so they can, you know, anyway. There's a lot of any fit. Now, if you've got one that you're earning $2,000 a trip, more power to you. That's a great market. Go for it, okay? But if you're not, ask yourself the question, if I spent the hours that I spend at farmer's market, if I spent that creating my own marketing scheme and brand label, where would I be? And I would suggest that most of the time we'd be way farther ahead, which that's exactly what we did. So... Um, what, we, what happened was we had, these, we had these ladies coming down to the farm from Maryland, four hours away. And it was a ladies' day out. You know, some people go play bridge and golf. These ladies went on a, on a, a, a food uh, expedition. And um, they would, you know, ladies' day out. They would come down. They would stop at a few um, antique stores on the way down through the valley, see if there was anything there that the Yankees hadn't uh, carried off. And... Um, then they'd stop for lunch in Stanton, come on out to the farm, and they'd, you know, buy stuff. They'd come about once a quarter. They'd call the day before, and uh, we call them the Maryland ladies. And they'd come in with these little rolly coolers, you know, and go in there and, and um, go to the freezers, you know. And most people, they, they pick stuff out of the freezer shelves, right, you know. But these ladies didn't. I mean, they'd open the door, kick their cooler up against it, and just start raking it out, you know, blah, 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 you know, out of the, throw that in the side. Put it I mean, these ladies spent like 800 bucks every visit. We kind of grew to like these Maryland ladies. About 18 months into this, one of them pulled me aside and said, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of friends. I thought, I think I'd like to meet your friends. <laughs> so, but we've tried to get them to come down with us, and, and, you know, but they've got soccer and deacons meetings and all that. You know, they, they're just too busy. What would it take for you to come to us? Well, I didn't want to go, you know, beating the pavement to them. So... You know, how are we going to, what are we going to do? I said, well, I guess if you got $3,000 in product sales, you know, I'll come to you. I figured that would shut them up. What I didn't know was, was that the senior of these four ladies was one of these um, inner city, know thyself, ooh, you know, yin, yang, uh, woo, get in touch with your inner being. <laughs> Written about six books, you know. <laughs> and um, she was a guru, you know. So the next week at class, she told her disciples, um, I found our food. Here's where you sign up. The next day on Thursday, she calls me and says, we got your $3,000 worth of product. What do you, you know, when are you coming? <laughs> what do you do? Drive, baby. <laughs> and that birthed the Metropolitan Buying Clubs. Now, Delivery becomes a big issue. I'm setting a stage for something here that's really critical. Delivery becomes a big issue. It is one of, distribution is one of the biggest weak links right now in the local food system. We can grow it, but how do you, how do you get economies of scale and efficiency in getting it from my farm to the customer? You know, and we all know about the supermarket system. That seems to be so efficient. But, you know, how do, we, how do we do this now? And so back when we started with restaurants, we made a, one of the best decisions we ever made was if we were going to be in the distribution business, we need to carve that out as a separate business. The temptation is to wrap everything up under one umbrella. But when you think about 
business acquisitions and subcontracting and how the business world works, it really is very segmented. I mean, you've got freelance, I'm looking at videographers here, you've got freelance sound guys and gals, freelance videographers, you've got, you know, uh, a, a freelance marketers. And all these people, they, they create um, sometimes long-term, but many times short-term alliances, create little, you know, short-term contracts, and, and work together as a team, and then they realign the team later, okay? And, and that's the way the business world works. So I want us to think about that with a local food distribution system. We carved out a delivery by the pound system in order to truly track the costs of our delivery system. I don't know a farm in the country that's running a delivery system that buries the delivery cost in their product that's honest about the cost of delivery. Every single one of them is subsidizing the delivery from the farm gate price. Because none of us is honest enough to look ourselves in the mirror and realize how expensive putting that truck on the road is. And, so, and I, wanted, I wanted wiggle room to be able to carve that off as a separate business anytime I wanted to. And by having the delivery cost separate, we do that with our chefs. The chefs don't like it. Cisco doesn't do that. You know, they've all got exotic voices because they've been trained in some chalet in the Swiss Alps. You know, what is this the delivery charge? You know, and, uh, and, 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 and our response is, well, we, you know, we want you to be informed about the cost of getting it to your doorstep. Now, if you want to come to the farm and get it, you know, you can get it at the price, and, and, and that's great. But if you want to deliver to your doorstep, we want you to understand how much it gets to be there because we don't want ignorant shifts. About that time, you're like, oh, that's fine. I don't want to be ignorant either. That's fine. Just bring it on, you know. And, and <laughs> it's all done. So, you, you know, you, you spin it. You don't apologize for the inconvenience or for the differences. Instead, you educate and use the difference as a loyalty leverage. I'm doing this for your benefit, so you'll be the smartest chef in the country. See? And what it enabled us to do was as soon as that restaurant business built up enough, we were able to carve that off as a as a one afternoon a week, hundred dollar, and this is going back, you know, 25 years, a hundred dollar a week, three hour um, job for somebody. Well, there are a lot of people that would love to work one afternoon a week for three hours for a hundred bucks. Okay? And so in our businesses, what I'm trying to get to is we want to structure them. We want to, from the outset, we want to structure them so that we can create short-term and long-term alliances with people who take ownership as subcontractors so we don't have a bunch of employees. When Sherry came to the farm, she realized that one of our, um, no, I'm getting ahead of myself, Okay, so, so we did these metropolitan buying clubs. So we had several subcontractors over there, and about the time Daniel and Sherry got married, our current subcontractor decided to go do something else. And uh, um, it was only, you know, like 30, 40 families or something. It took, you know, an afternoon a month. It was a great for, a, you know, a young, uh, well, a, a new mom, and, and it was good for her. And so we said, well, what are we going to do? And she, and she um, and I'm, I'm, you know, if she were telling this, it would be so much better because she did some marketing as a teenager and you know, she was homeschooled as well. So she had opportunities to you know, get her feet dabbled with different things that institutional education doesn't let you do. And she, she was very self-confident about her ability to market. And she loves marketing. You know, one of the biggest, most amazing discoveries in the world is when you realize, you know that job that you just can't stand to do? You know, there's a couple things that you just really don't like to do. Do you know that there are people on this planet that love to do that stuff? I mean, they just, they just can't wait to get up in the morning and make more cold calls. Ah! That's like a root canal without Novocaine. But there are people who thrive on that. 
So I hope one of the big takeaways from my presentations today is to understand the, the breadth and depth of what we have to do to have continuity farm businesses, but to realize you don't have to do it all. All we have to do is design the system so that other people will be drawn to the things that we're not good at, that we don't like to do. I went to a conference once. It was a great little uh, pictograph, you know, three circles with, you know, an intersection of the three. One is what you're good at, one is what you love, and one is what you know. And where what you're good at, what you love, and what you know, where they intersect, that's your sweet spot. And so all of our life needs to be trying to move closer and closer and closer so that we get rid of the stuff that are outside of that and we focus ourselves on where those three intersect. You got that? What we're good at, what we know, and what we love. Okay? When we leverage those three things and they all come together, that's our sweet spot. And so one of the, one of the beauties of, of uh, accounting is that it allows you to track margins and track different enterprises. And so, you know, believe it or not, our P&L statement, our profit and loss statement is 14 pages. I mean, Jackie, our accountant, you know, she says, I've never seen one this long. Well, why is it so long? Because we categorize everything. That way you can track your margins on every single enterprise. If you can't track your margins on every single enterprise, what happens is we have some that are very lucrative and some that are losing, and you don't know where you are. You might end up, you know, growing the one that's losing you the most money instead of you know, uh, uh, putting emphasis on the one that's really carrying the ball game. And so when Sherry came, it was, uh, we had the Metropolitan Buying Clubs that were available. So she said, I'll do it. She was looking at her love of marketing and her interest in internet and that development. And so Sherry started in whatever it was, 2007, I guess, something like that. And she has taken the Metropolitan Buying Clubs from 30 families to over 5,000 families. And here's the secret. We didn't know if Sherry could sell. I mean, we loved her. She was our daughter-in-law. I mean, she was, I mean, she, you know, of all the girls that Daniel ever, you know, brought around, she was the one that Teresa and I would have picked. So, I mean, we were very, it's not like we were displeased with the, you know, with the pick, okay? But she didn't have a track record with us. Now, if we'd have put her on wages or a salary, said, okay, you can do this for, you know, $10,000 a year, or 15 or whatever, or five, or one. We didn't know whether she'd bomb, she didn't have a track record. So what we did, we put her on a commission, a sales commission. All the sales that come in from the Metropolitan Buying Clubs, she gets 3% every single sale. Now, when she started, it was a few bucks. Today, She's created a very, very comfortable passive income for herself. Okay? She still does it. But she still does it at that 3% commission. So by putting it on a commission and not a wage or salary, it freed both parties up in a bit of a, eh, you know, a, a, a non-track, little bit of a trust situation to be able to go. Fortunately, she was confident enough to take the commission and say, yeah, I'm going to show them. And she did it, and you know, my goodness, all, we've been trying to run, keep up with her ever since. Because we had no idea what we had. I mean, she, she'd rather you know, market than just about anything. Okay? She eats it and loves it. Okay? And so it was the, the commission-based approach that enabled the two kind of, you know, circling parties to be able to create room to build a relationship. Everybody follow that? That's really critical. All right. So, you know, Sherry ran on and did this. 
Richard, our delivery guy, you know, he has a base salary, but we have a, we have a, a benchmark that when he hits that benchmark, he gets a large commission on every sale above that. You know what that does? That makes him take care of customers. That means he never gets a salary raise. He does his salary raise. And if he doesn't take care of business and it drops, he doesn't get a salary raise. That makes him hungry. And we believe hunger makes people creative. I'm so thankful that our family was not wealthy. You know, Teresa and I got married and we drove a $50 car. We were married 20 years before we spent $10,000 in total on automobiles. Now, we had some help along the way. You know, we had a customer that said, you know, you really should drive a better car. I'm getting ready to either give my car to the Salvation Army or, 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 or give it to you. We said, well, what is it? You know, a Lincoln Town car. I drove Teresa around the block. She got it. She said, where do I sign? He sold us a Lincoln Town car for a dollar. We drove it for two years. I mean, you know, when you direct market, would you believe that there are actually people out there who want to patronize your product and want you to be more successful than you? Can you believe that? I mean, in our dog-eat-dog, dog, you know, Enron, bank bailout, GM, whatever, you know, business world, it's hard to believe that there are actually people who you can relationally market to and who want you to be successful. And so Richard has a built-in incentive to take care of customers, to find new markets, because we're not out there. You know, he's out there. So as this all grew, it became more than Sherry could handle. So she needed to break off, so she decided, I'll keep, I'll keep the Metropolitan Buying Clubs. Let's find somebody else to do the restaurant sales, weekly restaurant sales. So we found another young gal there in the community and gave her, on the commission basis, the restaurants, and they've continued to grow and grow. And again, here's another gal. She works from home part-time. She does about three different things. Again, another homeschooler. Um, is there a theme here? Um, and, and, and she, you know, she's, whatever, 27, something like that. And she has now carved out for herself this wonderful uh, income working from home. I mean, because she makes the calls every Tuesday. All she has to do is come over to the farm every Thursday when everything gets put on the delivery truck, you know, to, to do the invoices and handle all that. But she gets a straight commission. She's not guaranteed a penny. She lives or dies based on sales. So there are several other producers in the area, about six produce growers, a, an artisanal cheese maker. They now use Hannah as well. So Hannah's now their marketer. That leverages her phone calls. She gets a commission for their sales, and she makes a nice living off of making Tuesday phone calls to restaurants. Basically a one day a week, frantic day, yes, calling all these chefs, but it's a one day a week deal. She can do other things other times a week, but all on commission. By running commission-based enterprises, it creates room for people to start that doesn't jeopardize the, you know, the current uh, uh, business with an investment that might not come back. And it completely rewards performance. All right? So then the restaurants grew even more than Hannah could handle. And so we decided, well, let's break off the Washington, D.C. restaurants. Because we already had a commission and we had a delivery rate, Susan came on board. She works from home in D.C., and does all the DC marketing and delivery, and because she's doing all the delivery too, she gets the entire delivering amount and the marketing commission. Okay? So I hope you're seeing the progress. It starts with the children appreciating the, the autonomy of children and, and letting them build their own fiefdoms. Everybody needs a fiefdom, don't they? We all want to fiefdom. 
So that lets them build their own fiefdoms, and then we take that idea to other people. So we run um, an intern and apprentice program. And the interns come for four months, June 1 to September 30. That's the starting point. That's boot camp. That's, you know, everybody comes and, 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 and does that. And then at the midpoint, they can apply to be an apprentice. And that's 12 months. Okay. At the midpoint of the internship, we have a sit down with all the interns and ask them, time and money are not an issue. What would you like to do? And many of them would like to stay with us. And so we don't say, okay, we'll give you a job. Instead, we say, okay, you've been here a few months. You see the, out, the operation. Bring us a compensation package. Bring us a plan. And we then put on them the onus to create their salary. You know how liberating that is for me and for us Salatons to not feel like we have to provide jobs for people. Rather, we put the monkey on their back and say, bring us a proposal. And so several years ago, about six or seven years ago, I really um, started dropping hints about I would like, I'd sure like to be able to eat communally Monday through Friday, but, you know, we can't fix all the meals. You know, there's about 20 of us or so, um, you know, but I would sure like to have the camaraderie and community feel of all the interns, apprentices, and us, and everybody, you know, eating together Monday through Friday at the evening meal. How do you do that? And so we started, you know, dropping little hints around. Well, another hint that I dropped around was I'd like a gardener. See, I like a garden. Daniel doesn't like a garden. Um, Daniel's looking, you know, he, he, he likes the animals and all that, and he just never liked the garden. I, 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 we always had a wonderful garden when we were first starting, and I wasn't so busy traveling and doing this stuff, and I like the garden. I like to be able to walk out the back door and just feel like I'm, I'm nested in abundance. You know, I just like that, that feel, all right? Daniel being ultimately functional, you know, he says, look, in the amount of time it takes me to pick a bushel of green beans, I can raise $1,000 worth of chickens and go to the farmer's market and buy green beans. And, and you know, I get that. As a dad, I have to be willing to say, that's okay. So now suddenly, the burden is on me, and if I want this garden, if I want this thing, and I can't force Daniel to do it, and I don't want to force Daniel to do it, because that changes all sorts of things. So if I want this, how can we get this done so everybody wins, so Daniel doesn't have to do it, and I get what I want? So I started putting these drops around. And about six years ago, one of our former uh, interns called me and said, hey, you know, is that, is that chef position still open? I said, absolutely. He says, is that gardener's position still open? Absolutely. So Dan came as a chef slash gardener, created his own compensation package. I'll do the chefing for this much, do the garden for this much, and he invoices us, all right? And he was there two years. He did the shiitake mushrooms. He started that business. The, I, the, the point is, he was not an employee. He was billing us as a professional farmer. Imagine that a professional farmer who gives invoices for their production. A price maker instead of a price taker. Wow, that's an amazing concept. And so what has developed are what we call memorandums of understanding. So we don't have employees per se. What we have are memorandums of understanding that define a time, polyface obligations, the partner collaborator's obligations, the compensation, and every one of them carries a non-litigation clause. We will, not, we will not form collaborative arrangements with anybody that is willing to sue anybody. And so everybody has to sign this thing that says, my fault, your fault, nobody's fault, no matter what happens, nobody sues anybody. Okay? 
we think that's the only way to really have a shared, you know, relationship. Because if there's always that little idea of somebody, you know, suing, it, it, it colors everything. And so, so now, you know, we have these memorandums of understanding in place. So we rent these farms. We rent nine farms in the area. Several of them have housing on them. Some of them don't. And so we have young people that want to stay with the team that are creating their own package. Well, I'd like to move cows, move pigs, um, have a garden, um, you know, do a pair of egg mobiles and raise 4,000 broilers. And so what we've done is create numerous compensation uh, um, uh, benchmarks, amounts, for how much risk the person wants to take. Some young, some young people come with a little bit of nest egg, and they, they want to capitalize a little bit. Others don't have a penny to their name. So we incentivize the, the compensation packages to incentivize risk. Because this is where tension comes in. If somebody says, I want to raise 4,000 broilers for you under the polyface you know, label. All right, fine. We want you to do that. Well, if we go out there and we own the chickens and we buy the feed and all that and all they're getting paid is piecework like so much of marketable chicken. If we go out there and a bunch of wasted feed is on the ground, that's a point of, 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 of tension because it's our feed. You know, so um, three years ago, we had... Um, Two subcontractors, one owned their chickens and one didn't. We had a 100 degree day. Daniel called both of them and said, look, it's going to be 100 degrees this week. You know, get things, um, you know, aerated so that we can handle this, this heat. One didn't get anything done, went out and had 100 suffocated chickens in the, in the field shelters. Now, we didn't like it. But we weren't frustrated, we weren't, frustrated. well, yeah, we were, but, but we, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal because they were his chickens. He owned them. He bought the chicks, owned the chickens, bought the feed, owned the, the shelters, the whole deal, okay? The other guy didn't open up his brooder and suffocated 700 chicks. They were our chicks. Tension. As my grandson says, who's eight, uh, Andrew, he's a, he's, a, he's a real chick magnet already at eight, and all the little girls, you know, they're all planning their marriages. Here's our house. Here's where we're going to live and all this stuff. And whenever they come up to Andrew and start, you know, smoothing his hair and, you know, loving on him, he just looks around and says, awkward, awkward. <laughs> well, that's the way it was with this subcontractor that had the suffocated chicks. All right? Awkward. All right. So what we so so we we write these MOUs, memorandums of understanding, to incentivize them owning as much of it as possible, to take those points of, of tension, those possible you know misunderstandings, misperceptions, and things out of it, so that they share risk. The main thing I'm trying to get to is that the farm, the business, is gradually taking on the product line and the, and the, 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 the um, persona, not so much of me, but of the gifts and talents that we have at any one time. I can't tell you how liberating that is. Suddenly now, I'm not necessarily responsible for this you know, big ship and visioning and making sure all this happens and, and providing jobs and, and making sure everything gets done. Now, all I am is a germination tray to allow these young people to plant their seeds and sprout in my germination tray. And that's ultimately extremely liberating. So several years ago, Bree wanted to stay. I said, okay, Bree, so what do you want to do? He said, well, I really like kids, and it bums me that the farm isn't providing school tours for, for children. You know, we just don't have the personnel for it. He said, could I, could I do that as a business? I said, Absolutely. Slam dunk, good deal. So we birthed the grass stains tours. 
the grass stains tours. It was Bree's business, okay? We charged a certain amount per tour. Polyface got a little bit as a royalty, okay? She got the lion's share of it. Her business, she markets it. She developed the curriculum, decided where to go, how long, two hours. Talked with teachers, talked with parents. I mean, we had everything from Boy Scout troops to Cub Scouts to, to, to um, you know, middle schools, high schools, urban schools, rural schools, home schools. I mean, you name it. I mean, we just, uh, Montessori, I mean, everything, okay? And in just her second year, she did 60 farm tours. But it was her business. We didn't even know when people were coming. You know, if we saw a bus come in and a bunch of kids walking across the meadow, we oh, I guess Bree has a tour. And it allows us to duplicate, to leverage our resource base without us having to run it, do it, and all that. Okay? It's incredibly um, um, leveraging. All right? So, you know, so last year when Bree decided, you know, that's the one problem with running a farm with a bunch of young people. You know, they got dreams and fantasies and things to do and places to go. So he said, I really want to go to the uh, Ballymolo Irish Cooking Culinary School. Okay. Well, I'm really bummed. What are we going to do with our, I mean, we have 60 tours. I mean, adults. I mean, this is a huge outreach. You can, I mean, they all come with adults who become customers, buy stuff at the store. I mean, it's a very, you know, symbiotic uh, deal. Oh, no. What are we going to do? See, that's the tough part of this, is allowing myself to release these enterprises and realize if we don't have a young person that wants to step up and do this, it's okay. We won't do it. Fortunately, one of our last year's interns was trying to create his compensation package to take one of the farms. He said, I'd really like to do those grass stains tours. So he's up and running. He's just taking it right over from B, and it's seamless continuity right into the future. But by having it a totally independent enterprise, it makes it real easy for it to move from person to person and just bequeath these enterprises to different people. When Dan left with the shiitake mushrooms, nobody wanted to do the shiitake mushrooms. So, you know, we're just harvesting, but we're not taking care of them. And, and it's okay, and we won't deal with them until somebody steps up and wants to do it. The whole idea is to create customized fiefdoms so that people are autonomous and have the authority to run their own fiefdom within your, your umbrella. And you can't believe how many things you could get done that way. So, you know, uh, when, when, when um, so, so Leanna, uh, who was our product manager, married Eric, our apprentice manager. And um, so she didn't want to do the garden. She'd done it for two years. And so she wanted to concentrate on being a, a wife and, a, and, do, and continuing with the product inventory. Oh, no, I lost my gardener. Now what am I going to do? So just a few miles away, there's a young, energetic homeschooler gal that's graduating this spring, and she's desperate to come and do a garden and be serious, uh, be a serious farmer. So we can move Leanna's and Dan's memorandums of understanding seamlessly over. So the way the garden works is, the gardener pays their royalty to us for having this opportunity is so many pounds of product. There's no money. Okay, for, for Sherry and Teresa, for our personal canning and larder and all that, okay? All right, so we, we described that. That's the first thing. And then they put down everything they want to grow and how much they want to get paid for it. We don't tell them how much we're going to pay. You give us your price, okay? Now, by faith, we, we are assuming that we can work with the price that they're working with. All right? I mean, if they were somebody we couldn't trust, we wouldn't want to partner with them, all right? So they create their compensation. And then we agree on a tier of marketing. Because remember, yes, there is freedom, 
but it has to be freedom that fits. For example, a subcontractor that wants to say, I want to grow 30,000 chickens. No, we can't do that. We can't sell 30,000 chickens. Okay? So it has to fit with what we're doing. We're coordinating all these. And so, um, so, so she carves all this out. So her first market is to the farm kitchen for the farm chef. And we've now replaced Brie for the farm chef. So we have a lady coming. Um, she... You know, she's going to be our farm chef for this year. And so she's going to do that. Um, and she will buy, like we've been doing in the past, buy the vegetables from the gardener. So rather than, rather than being employees, the farm chef bills us an invoice as a professional. And the gardener gives us an invoice for the food that goes through the kitchen it completely changes the arrangement when she is providing invoices for what she produces rather than just collecting a paycheck out of the polyface kitty. Are you with me? It completely changes the arrangement. So she owns the business. Now, once she so that's her first market is the kitchen. Second market is the on-farm store. So she can produce as much as she wants for the on-farm store. Then she, if, she, if she produces more than that, then she can sell them through Hannah to the restaurants. And, and if she produces more than that, then you know, we have to talk about it. But anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the prioritization of the market that we all agree that this, these, are the, these are priorities in the market, and you can do as much as you want within that. And if ultimately you produce something that you can't sell, you get to eat it. We don't owe you a penny for that. It's your business, okay? That protects us from her just going hog wild on something that she really likes to grow but can't sell. And it incentivizes her to be market savvy. What are people buying? Let me, let me get some counsel here and ask, you know, what are people buying? So that's what I'm going to grow. See? And she is able to grow as much as she wants to within that. All right? So I got my gardener. And I get to walk out and enjoy this, you know, wonderful garden. And there it is. So last year, Heather wanted to stay. She wanted to run one of the farms. Okay, good, because one of those gals was, was moving to get married. She was going up to Maine to get married. Okay, great. So that opened up one of the farms. But that farm did not generate enough with the cows to pay a full-time salary. Well, last summer, we hatched our own chicks for the first time. We got an incubator and hatched about 500 chicks because we're getting very, very um, disenchanted with hatchery chicks. Uh, even, even the non-hybrids and the old standard American varieties. And so, you know, we're a believer in, in, uh, in survival genetics. Um, you know, don't do anything, don't medicate, don't vaccinate, don't do anything, and keep breeding the survivors, and you get strength, okay? Um, you know, don't tell the, you know, humane society. They'll take you to court for animal abuse if you do that. But that's what we do. All right. So, um, it's true. I mean, we've bambi-ited and thumper our culture to the point where everybody thinks that every animal needs an air-conditioned annie room on an L.L. Bean monogram chair. <laughs> I mean, three years ago, we spent three days with state veterinarians with an animal abuse charge. Some lady drove by our herd of cows on one of the rental farms, and these you know, 300 head were all you know, up at the gate ready for their 4 o'clock move, called 911. This is abusive. These animals are all crowded up. Crowds are stressful. Ew. Crowds are stressful. So we get to spend three days with animal abuse charges. I, that's why they call them a herd. You know, wouldn't it be great to live in a society where the animal abuse officer could laugh at the lady and say, lady, you're stupid. Bye. But no, they've got to... They've got to take three days of our time and go through this full, you know, bureaucratic report at taxpayers' expense for some, you know, fifi lady on her way to the garden club who doesn't know. Anyway, uh, what's our time like? Okay, um, so, so, we're, oh, so Heather, so, so um, Heather said, well, um, I, I think I would like to hatch chicks. So Heather's MOU. So we sat down and agreed on how much per chick 
both pullets and cockerels. This is creating a very new conundrum for us because we don't, we really don't want to feed the cockerel chicks to the pigs if we can help it. And so we'd like to grow them out. So the big unknown this summer is can we market these cockerels as, you know, uh, pasture genetic, old heritage type, you know, nativized genetics survivor. You know, they didn't survive our knife, but they survived everything else. Um, you know. And, you know, can, can we market these? You know, brown meat, orange fat, I mean, they are to die for, okay? The question is, can we market them? We tried this about 12 years ago, and, uh, and we, we, just, we just could not get enough market to, to move these uh, cockerels. So we're going to try it again. Hopefully, you know, with Paleo and, and Weston A. Price and some savvy people, hopefully we'll be able to do it. And if we don't, you know, maybe we'll... Uh, you know, maybe we'll develop a commercial kitchen and turn it into, you know, chicken stew or something and, and uh, um, sell it that way. Anyway, we, we really don't want to just throw away the cockerels just for a lot of reasons, like the industry does. And, and so, we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with that. But at, at the end of the day, if we can't come up with any solution, you know, we will feed the chicks to the pigs. The pigs will like it. Um, so, so Heather, so we've carved out for Heather an amount per, you know, pullet chick, an amount per cockerel chick, and it's her baby. She handles everything, does all the, all the uh, scheduling, uh, the setting of the eggs, the, you know, the, 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 the candling, the checking, all that stuff. It's her business, and she invoices us for the chicks. So here's the deal. Over time, you can look at the farm business and look at all your large expenses and say, all right, can we internalize these? So the final one I'll just share with you is uh, um, last year, one of our apprentices was done, and he wanted to stay with us. Jonathan. I said, well, Jonathan, what do you want to do? And, and, and I had been dropping tidbits that there has to come a time where our, our off-farm repair shop bills can pay for a full-time salary. Now, I don't know where that magic, you know, that magic tip-over, you know, point is, but there's a point. I mean, you know, we're a, we're a two and a half, over two and a half million dollar uh, business, okay? So, we, you know, we run seven tractors, and you know, we got like 200 tires, and, you know, we keep the local tire store in business, and, and so, you know, th this is a going concern, okay? There's, there's a lot going on here, all right? And so I'd been dropping these little, you know, just thinking out loud about these things. And Jonathan picked up on this. Well, Jonathan was a wonderful apprentice. I mean, he would rather weld than eat. I mean, he loves the shop. He loves fabrication, loves the, I mean, I do it, but I do it reluctantly. I do it because I have to, okay? But, but I, don't, I don't love it. And um, Jonathan loves it. And so he said... Um, well, I'd like to take one of the farms as a subcontractor, fine, and I'd like to offer you the services of a shop foreman. And so we agreed on an amount, and so he has started his own business called Farm Fix in our shop that we've given him the freedom to gut the shop, pull it all out, Redo it. I mean, he's hung lights in there. We're pouring concrete in there. He's got, I mean, he's already built tables. And, and, and I mean, he's turned this into, a, into a, a, a pretty cool shop. And for the first time in my life, I can go out in the field and break something and bring it back and just drop it off at the shop door and say, fix it. <laughs> and you know how cool that is? Not only that, but now he has a launch pad to develop his own shop farm combo business. So he's going to do one pair of eggmobiles, move a group of cows, and take, four, uh, and take the 20-acre uh, pig field over there next to that rental farm. And he's not going to do any broilers or anything like that. And so he doesn't want to do any of those. So that's his package. Somebody else... You know, they want to do a bunch of broilers and, um, and only do, you know, one pair of eggmobiles or whatever. Um, you know, we, we've, had, we've had young people come that want to do um, 
soap, you know, so we've, we've sold soap. Um, we, you know, uh, my brother's honey, you know, he, he does honey. He's an airplane mechanic and he likes to do the honey. So he, the honey is his business, all right? Um, Eric, this spring, he tapped all the uh, sugar maple trees. He's made 20 gallons of maple syrup that he'll sell for himself. Polyface doesn't need to get any of that. I'm just tickled that he's able to leverage something that we weren't using. The sap was there for all these years. It just wasn't being used. If he can make a couple thousand bucks off of it, I told Eric, I said, now you know that this maple syrup is worth a lot more as maple sugar donuts, <laughs> not just maple syrup. I'm always trying to get him to value add. You know, Always think about how do you value add. But the idea is, I'm not trying to grow my own wealth or our own estate or whatever. My pleasure, my deepest pleasure comes from seeing these young people find their niche, find their place of opportunity, and then sprout on our germination tray. And because we don't have employees, it creates room for that to happen. If I were defining, here's what I want done, this, this, this. Do you want this? Do you want, no, you don't. Okay, you want that. If I were defining on it, the dynamics would be completely different. Does everybody follow me? The dynamics would be completely different. So from a business model, we find this incredibly um, encouraging and empowering to find partners, to find people that will come in as not employees, but rather incentivize fiefdom autonomous partners to leverage resources that you have. And I think that as we move, as we move that kind of, a, of a, uh, a team business model forward, not only does it give us a tremendous amount of spontaneity among the different people, you know, I'll, it's like a monopoly game. I'll trade you one fiefdom for two. You know, I'll trade you this enterprise for that enterprise. And they can just trade out around among themselves. That's exactly what they do. I'll trade you this one for that one, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, keep, the, I'll keep the three guard dogs this winter, and, uh, and, and, and you can do something else. And, and, and you know, they, they just trade them off. So you know, when people ask, well, what's the future? I, say, I don't have a clue. People say, well, you know, what are you doing about energy? What are you doing about... Um, you know, sprouts or, you know, biochar or whatever. You know what? My answer is, when the people are here, it'll happen. So we have, you know, we, if, if a person came tomorrow that wanted to do biomass, uh, um, um, gas, wood biomass powered, uh, you know, steam generation, great. Aquaponics. Yeah, man. You know, a, 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 a cut flower business? Absolutely. See, here's the thing. When you have a customer base, the easiest thing to do when you have a customer base is not add a new customer, it's add a new product to your existing customer base. If there's one rule of marketing that applies everywhere, it is this. It is much easier to find 100 people who will spend $1,000 with you than 1,000 people who will spend $100 with you. The hard part in marketing is getting the customer the first time. Nobody makes a profit on the first sale. You only make a profit on your second and third and fourth sales. Those become easier and easier. So what we want to do is if we're selling, you know, vegetables, and maple syrup, we want to add chicken to that. And if we're selling maple syrup and chicken, we want to sell rabbits to that. And we want to you know, add uh, pecans. And, and this kind of, of arrangement allows us to do that. You see, most people are not evenly uh, gifted, even as farmers, within producing plants or animals. That's why you tend to see farms that gravitate toward animals and farms that gravitate toward plants, okay? And you don't generally see expertness on both of those things, because even among farmers. Well, here is a way to do that. I mean, tell me there's not a 1,000-acre wheat farm in Kansas 
that couldn't carve out one four-acre spot for you to do a produce operation on. Okay? We're not asking to be an employee of the farmer. All you're asking for is a, is a piece. And, and, as, and if the farmer has to pay you to come and help, that completely changes the, you know, the risk factor. But if you come in and say, I'll build a business, I'll build a pastured poultry operation on your um, uh, beef cattle farm, now there's no risk. See? I'll, I'll take... I'll tell you what, I'll take a portion of your apples, as much as I can sell as, as cider, I'll invest in the juicing equipment and develop the market, and I'll buy them at your price and let me have them to turn them into cider. You can start a whole cider business without an apple tree. Okay? Building an additional income on that existing place. So we have carved out, you know, we, we now appreciate that there are open-ended numbers of opportunities on our place. I mean, you could have everything from vineyard to orchard to nut trees to lumber. I mean, we came real close to having a, a, a woodworker come. He was a Cracker Jack woodworker. We got this wonderful sawmill. We're in black walnut cherry, you know, white oak country, you know, the Appalachians. Um, you know, the sawmill only gets run about, you know, 40 days a year. That thing ought to be run 250 days a year. Okay? So it's just sitting there. Infrastructure not being utilized. All it takes is a little more grease and a couple more blades, you know, and a couple of oil changes. And you're you know, low leverage. So you want to build a woodworking business on the farm and do cho toys and furniture and stuff to our customer base. One guy came by, and he didn't do it because his wife didn't want to live in Pennsylvania, but, but, but the opportunity was there. Another one came by, he was a, he was a, a, a mason that built these clay um, bread ovens. He was a baker and built these clay bread. Sure, come on, build it. I'm sure our customers would like bread. And we came this close, and he, his uh, wife inherited a farm in Missouri, so they took off the farm. I can't be, 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 you know, begrudge that either. But I hope, I hope that at this point, you're starting to realize that your place and my place and the place that you aren't even on yet, there are, there are so many development possibilities out there that you can't even go to sleep at night for all the potentials. But how we structure the money and the business arrangement is what gives wiggle room, trust capacity, and risk forgiveness in these kind of untested waters. And so uh, I hope that the idea of developing fiefdoms of responsibility and autonomy and authority um, is a word that will resonate. Can everybody say fiefdoms with me? Fiefdoms. Okay, remember that because I think that that is an answer to all of these tricky little employee, high-risk, you know, insurance, um, workman's comp, I mean, all these things. The reason that a lot of people are scared of growing their business is because they're scared of the business aspects of business. But with the fiefdom memorandum of understanding, it takes all of those business aspects and those compliance issues out of the equation and frees both parties to, you know, to, to, to dance. And that's what we desperately need to create. Fields of farmers. My dream is that all of this 50% of America's farmland is going to change hands in the next 15 years rather than being centralized and gobbled up by you know, foreign investors and, 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 and you know, centralized interests and being amalgamated, conglomerated, and adulterated, and prostituted, and whatever else happens to this land, that in fact, we will see an exponential entrepreneurial explosion of young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed self-starters to decentralize bring the economy from the urban to the rural, what I call the reverse cash flow, where the wealth in the country begins to reside in the information, the management, and the visionary savvy of a new generation of young people who will take this and love it and nurture it and bring redemption into our rural landscapes and our food systems. God help us to do it. Thank you very much for letting me do this. Thank you. Now, thank you.
Thank you. You're very kind. Now may all of your carrots, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. May your tomatoes be free of blossom end rot. May the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your cows be heavy with calf. May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise and call you blessed. And may we all make this nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Thank you.